Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. For many years, people thought that dementia, even though it had been discovered and described in 1906 by Alice Alzheimer, a lot of people just put it down to age and just said, you know, this is this is just age. And it's really taken some conversations uh, amongst all of the stakeholders, people living with dementias and scientists and doctors and politicians to understand that these are not just age, these are diseases. And as diseases, we should be able to treat them. And those changes are include shrinkage of the brain. So the brain is essentially literally dying over time. And if you look with a microscope, you can see the accumulation of two definitive pathologies. So these are clumps of abnormal protein in the brain. One's called amyloid plaques, and that's made of an amyloid beta peptide. It's really sticky and it sticks in and just essentially balls inside the brain, out of the outside of the neurons or the cells, but in the brain itself. And then inside the brain cells, inside the neurons, you get accumulation of tau protein in what we call neurofibrillary tangles. So plaques, tangles, and and um, brain cell death, the three definitive features of Alzheimer's disease, and it spreads through the brain very slowly over years, decades. Welcome to the Giant Shoulder podcast, where we break down the most fascinating and impactful neuroscience by standing on the shoulders of the giants that stood before us. This week's guest is Dr. Tara Spires-Jones, one of the leading Alzheimer's disease researchers in the entire world, and is currently the president of the British Neuroscience Association and director of the Center for Discovery Brain Sciences at the University of Edinburgh. Her lab's essential research focuses on the molecular mechanisms and reversibility of synapse degeneration in Alzheimer's disease. How the very circuits in our brain that make us, us, degenerate and die with age. I remember a fascinating study that I learned in college about this group of nuns. They donated their bodies to science after they, after they died, after they were deceased and autopsies on their brains revealed pretty severe Alzheimer's pathology, both tau and amyloid plaques, except none of the nuns from what anyone could see actually displayed any of the behavioral phenotypes of Alzheimer's disease. That's the religious order study that was the first time that was shown really well. Yeah. And what they have found and what others have found since is that about a third of people who live into their 80s or 90s will have these pathologies in their brain and certainly not a third of people will have dementia. So it's it was part of driving this concept of resilience or um, vulnerability to degeneration. The other thing about the religious order studies and the nuns is that they will have had very habitual ritual lifestyles, right? right. So you know, it's a um, part of it maybe that the ritual was was able to to cover up some of the symptoms they might have otherwise had if they were, you know, having to do things that were a little bit outside of a, a very strict routine. But there is more to it than that. We think that some people can just their brains can put up with a ton of pathology, like full blown Alzheimer's disease pathology and not have any symptoms whatsoever. And we call that brain resilience. And part of it is this idea that it's not really the lesions themselves, the plaques and the tangles, but part of it is also we think that the networks of people who the brain networks of people who can have a lot of pathology are very very strong and robust and um, do we know what are the major contributing factors to brain resilience you know this has got to be one of the most important things for people listening you know what can they do today no matter what age they are to make their brain more resilient as they age yeah it's a great question there are 14 very strongly supported modifiable risk factors estimated that maybe 40 or 45 percent of dementias could have been prevented with modifiable risk factors so the best evidence so far is this was one of my favorite podcasts to record but one of the things that i learned from tara was that alzheimer's disease research is chronically underfunded and i want to try to do my small bit as a neuroscience communicator to help so 100 percent of the revenue that i earn from this podcast for life will be donated to various alzheimer's disease research progress around the world this includes all ad revenue future brand deals and super likes which you can buy down below or if you would prefer you can donate directly to the alzheimer's association research links that i I will leave down below as well. Subscribe to the channel and share the video to get the very important word out. Now on to one of the most important episodes I've ever done with the incredible Dr. Tara Spires-Jones. Dr. Tara Spires-Jones, welcome to the Giant Shoulder podcast. I'm so excited to speak to you. You've dedicated an enormous amount of your life to studying Alzheimer's disease. So let's start there. What is Alzheimer's? Hi, and thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, so Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. So you have you met someone living with dementia? Yes, I, I suspect that my grandmother before she passed, although never having a formal diagnosis, almost certainly had dementia, yes. Yeah, it's, it's a really common condition, unfortunately, but dementia is the set of symptoms that most of us, unfortunately, have experience of, right? It's the idea that people 
uh, are declining in their cognitive abilities, things like memory and reasoning and, and things like that. And of course, as the disease progresses, these symptoms get worse and worse. But the dementia symptoms aren't really the disease. The disease is caused by underlying, or the, the symptoms are caused by underlying diseases. And the most common cause is Alzheimer's disease. So right. Alzheimer's is about 60% of people living with dementia have it because of underlying changes in their brain due to Alzheimer's disease. And those changes are include shrinkage of the brain. So the brain is essentially literally dying over time. And if you look with a microscope, you can see the accumulation of two definitive pathologies. So these are clumps of abnormal protein in the brain. One's called amyloid plaques, and that's made of an amyloid beta peptide. It's really sticky, and it sticks in and just essentially balls inside the brain, out of the outside of the neurons or the cells, but in the brain itself. And then inside the brain cells, inside the neurons, you get accumulation of tau protein in what we call neurofibrillary tangles. So plaques, tangles, and and um, brain cell death are the three definitive features of Alzheimer's disease, and it spreads through the brain very slowly over years, decades. Right. How did you get into this field? How did you start studying Alzheimer's disease? Let's take a few steps back into your your leap into this whole gigantic area. Yeah, how far back do you want to go? So um, I was always interested in science as a kid. I mean, I, I thought I might be a Broadway star, but I don't have the talent for that. But my, my love has, has been uh, science, really, for, for most of my life. Um, and when I went to university, I was studying biochemistry because I had a, a scholarship that was for the chemistry department. And I got the scholarship through my acting, which is funny, <laughs> through through a, a high school cool. acting competitions. But I was I went into biochemistry because I loved chemistry in school, but I thought I might... Um, really be more interested in biology. And about halfway through my degree, I realized that while I loved studying chemistry and biochemistry, that the research wasn't what really, I wasn't passionate about it. It's, it was a very mature field and I wasn't really excited about the active research question. So I started thinking about the brain and really wanted to move into neuroscience. This was in the 1990s and there wasn't a neuroscience degree at my university in Texas at that time. So I finished off biochemistry and then I went to do a master's degree in neuroscience, followed by a PhD in neuroscience at Oxford. And it was during my PhD that I started to love um, neurodegeneration, which is I started off in neurodevelopment. So how the brain wires during development and how it can change in response to the environment when you're very young. And then about halfway through my PhD, I started looking at sort of the opposite question about how the brain changes when it's degenerating in aging. And I started off in Huntington's disease models. And then during my postdoc, I went to Boston to work with Brad Hyman to study Alzheimer's disease because he and I had a chat when I was interviewing there. And he just told me how important synapse loss was for Alzheimer's disease. It's the closest correlate. So do you know what synapses are? Sorry, I should take a step back. Yeah, let's let's give yeah. a let's give a breakdown <laughs> on what this is. Like I like this is a neuroscience podcast, so regular listeners will have some idea, of course, what a synapse is. But I like I like to be the, as accessible as possible. So so let's let's go from that basis. Yeah. So you'll you'll know that the brain is made up of neurons, the brain cells that make the network, and they talk to each other through synapses. So one neuron sends a signal down its axon, releases a neurotransmitter, and it gets picked up by the next neuron. And that junction where that happens is the synapse. Right. And in the brain, I told you about plaques and tangles and atrophy, so loss of brain cells. But there are other things that happen in the brain. Loss of synapses is of all the things we can measure in the brain, the thing that tracks most closely with your cognitive decline. And that's not really a surprise. So your listeners who are used to thinking about neuroscience will know that synapses are very plastic, we call it. So they're very adaptable. They are very important for learning and memory and thinking. So it's not really a surprise that a disease involving memory decline involves synapses and synapse loss. So when Brad and I started talking about that, this is now 20 years ago that I joined his lab as a postdoc in 2004, uh, I got really excited about this idea of maybe we could understand how and why synapses are dying in Alzheimer's disease. And that would give us a real handle on how we might stop these symptoms uh, from progressing or maybe even get a little bit of function back. So that's where I came to it 20 years ago was this idea that I was an expert almost, you know, I was just finishing my PhD in studying synapses and their plasticity and how they form and mature and then how they decline in a degener degenerative model. And that's when I jumped into the Alzheimer's field to study how they change in Alzheimer's disease. Brilliant. And how has the whole field of neurodegeneration and Alzheimer's really evolved over the last two decades? Because I know there's been a lot of different theories on what the really underlying mechanism for Alzheimer's is that has shifted over time. I studied neuroscience in college and I was, um, I was given a number of different ideas. So I'd love to hear kind of a brief, what's, what's, it, like, what's it been like in the last two decades really in neuroscience, uh, in neurodegeneration and Alzheimer's? What's really evolved? What's changed? Yeah, the Alzheimer's field is a whole different place from where it was when I joined 20 years ago. So the most exciting thing is 
for the first 19 years or 17, 18 years of, of that time in the field, we had no treatments that could change the course of the disease. There are a few treatments that have been approved since the 1970s that sort of boost remaining synapses and they help the symptoms a little bit. Those are the cholinesterase inhibitors that you probably have heard of if you've lived with anyone who has dementia. Uh, and there's one NMDA receptor modulator as well. But until very recently, until just a year or two ago, we didn't have anything that could so even slow the progression down. Those just made you feel a bit better. They didn't stop this inexorable progression of the disease that always ends in death. But over the past couple of years, we've had the approval in the United States of drugs that actually remove the sticky amyloid from the brain and they slow down cognitive decline. I want to stress they're not a cure. They're not even approved in the UK yet. They have risks, but from a scientific perspective, it's huge. They pass their phase three clinical trials and they actually do what they're supposed to do. They remove amyloid and they slow disease progression. And when I came to the field 20 years ago, there was none of that. So if you went to the clinical conferences, I'm not a clinician, I'm a fundamental neuroscientist in a lab, but at the conferences where we talk about progression in Alzheimer's disease, for years, we would go to these conferences and there would be failed trial after failed trial. It was kind of a depressing space to be in. Right. Uh, and on the on the science side, there was this debate going on about whether the disease was caused entirely by amyloid. So the amyloid cascade hypothesis has been the dominant hypothesis since the 1990s. And there's a huge amount of scientific support for this or rationale because there are rare genes that cause Alzheimer's disease and all of those increase amyloid production or decrease its clearance or make it more sticky. So all of those, if you have familial Alzheimer's disease, it's caused by changes in amyloid. The problem is that for many years, these amyloid directed targeted things weren't helping people, even though we could make mice a bit better. Uh, and the amyloid itself in the brain doesn't track with your symptom progression. So you usually will have a brain full of amyloid. You'll have the a full amount you're going to get uh, before you have even symptoms in the brain, <laughs> symptoms of the disease. You have it in the brain. Uh, but what tracks much more closely is the tau pathology and this loss of neurons and synapses with your with your disease. So a lot of people were thinking maybe we should be going after tau pathology or going after trying to stop the neurodegeneration, which everybody's still working. Lots of people are still working on that. Uh, the amyloid cascade has evolved a little bit over the years. So instead of thinking that it's the only thing that drives Alzheimer's disease, what we think is it's very important for initiating the disease process. But downstream of that early accumulation of amyloid, you start to get the tau clumping up and spreading through the brain. And that tracks much more closely. So it's more like a trigger, not sort of a, a driver of disease. And the other thing that has been a pretty big revolution for scientists in the field is when I joined 20 years ago, we thought the plaques and tangles that define the disease, we thought those were killing cells and killing synapses. And that was the problem. Turns out those are actually not what's probably doing the damage. It's the soluble forms of those proteins. So, you know, as neuroscience aficionados, you're probably aware of the, some of the basic molecular biology, right? You have genes that encode proteins and the proteins go and do stuff. Well, usually when you have a gene, it gets made into RNA and you get one copy of the protein and it goes and does whatever it's supposed to do. In the case of tau, that binds microtubules and your neurons axons and makes them stable and helps the neurons transport stuff. Um, but in the case of disease, instead of just having one copy of the tau protein or the amyloid protein, they stick together and you have first just oligomers, so a few copies together. And then you eventually get fibrils and these massive lesions that we can see down the microscope. We all thought it was the big things, the plaques and tangles that were toxic, but it turns out it's the oligomers. <laughs> it's the stuff that's smaller, just a few copies that's still able to interact with receptors on your cells and get in the way of normal cell function that have been toxic. So that was another revolution. Not only did we decide that amyloid wasn't the be all and end all, but we decided that, you know, we learned that it's not the big aggregates, but the soluble types of these proteins that are damaging the brain and the disease. Right. That's a great breakdown. Thank you so much. Because it, there's, there's a lot of words there, right? So you did very well there describing sort of what tau pathology is. So tau, when it's not in the pathologized form, is helping to stabilize microtubules in our cells. It has a normal function in the brain. And what about amyloid? Does that have a non-pathological <laughs> function? Does that exist in the brain D distinct from Alzheimer's disease? Let's describe a little bit more about what amyloid is. Just so these terms that are going to be thrown around a lot in this podcast are really concretely understood. Yeah, absolutely. So amyloid beta is the tiny sticky bit of the peptide that sticks in the plaques and the oligomers are toxic. If the whether amyloid beta itself has a normal function is still not fully understood, it's still debated in some systems. Amyloid beta, there was a guy named Rob Moore in Boston who who found that amyloid beta peptide, the stuff that sticks, is an antimicrobial peptide. So in cultures it can kill microbes and that could be a normal function in the brain, but there's not okay. a huge amount of evidence that that is a normal function that happens in the brain. 
But the parent protein, the bigger protein that A-beta is made from is called amyloid precursor protein. And that does seem to have normal functions. They're not really as well defined still as tau's normal functions, the canonical function of tau to bind microtubules. It does other things, but that's its like main function. Whereas ABP, we're not entirely sure, but it does a lot of things. It's important for the growth of neurons, so the outgrowth of the processes of neurons and development. When you have brain, uh, when you have damage to axons, APP is upregulated and goes there, and we think it's probably doing something good, something protective, uh, but it's not as concrete. But yes, it is a normal protein. APP is in the brain. It's expressed all the way through your life, and it seems to be doing some important things for, for brain health. We don't just know exactly what and when, uh, but there are lots of things it can do in cultures and in mouse models. And we think it's probably important for neurodevelopment and response to injury, but not exactly how, not quite as well defined as tau. Interesting, interesting, because I had remembered tau from college, but hadn't quite remembered exactly what amyloid's function is. So that's very useful, because again, those two terms are thrown around in sort of all, even, even normal newspaper articles about Alzheimer's will talk about tau fibrillary bundles and, and amyloid and plaques and these things. And I just wanted to have a very clear idea of what those two things were. Yeah, um, sorry, I should probably go back to one more thing. My favorite do. potential role of A-beta. So APP, the amyloid precursor protein, is important for neuride outgrowth and response to injury. A-beta has been proposed as this antimicrobial, but the other thing that low levels of A-beta actually seem to promote synaptic plasticity, which I think is fascinating. Again, it's still only in model systems, but it could be doing something good for the synapse. Tau as well, synapses are my favorite part of the brain, by the way, so I'm a bit biased, but tau as well has been shown to have normal functions, not only in the microtubules, but in synaptic functions. So again, linking both of those pathological proteins to synapse function, and when they go wrong, they're both linked to synapse death. Right. So it's quite clear then how pathological function of these things that are critical to synaptic function could have, a, have difficulties in learning and memory. Fundamentally, we need our synapses connecting and firing properly to learn and remember information. So it's quite clear. Is, is there sort of a direct link there that we can see that the learning and memory difficulties that are from Alzheimer's are from these breakdown on a circuit level of these different things that you've mentioned? Yes, absolutely. So it's not quite as clear cut that the normal A beta and tau loss is contributing to the memory dysfunction, but the pathological functions of both of these synapses absolutely are contributing to your symptoms. We think that the amyloid beta, we know from our lab and many labs around the world, amyloid beta can stick to synapses and it can cause dysfunction. It can impair plasticity and in animals can impair, impair memory directly. And we're pretty sure that that's playing a role in the early phases, at least of the disease process. Those sort of not quite the dementia phase, but when you're starting to have problems with thinking and memory, but your brain can make up for a lot of amyloid in, in, in it. So some people can have a full load of amyloid and never have any memory problems at all. So what yeah. we think is really driving more of the symptoms of memory decline is probably the tau pathology to do with the synapses and also just the loss of neurons, but certainly the circuit breakdown is driving the memory problems and the cognitive decline. Right. I remember a fascinating study that I learned in college about this group of nuns. I'm sure you're familiar with this because I think it's quite common where yeah. they had this large group of nuns. I, I can't remember where they were, but they donated their bodies to science after they after they died, after they were deceased. And autopsies on their brains revealed pretty severe Alzheimer's pathology, both tau and amyloid plaques, except none of the nuns from what anyone could see actually displayed any of the behavioral phenotypes of Alzheimer's disease. And this was sort of one of the big studies that really put a question mark on this amyloid beta hypothesis and like what is really driving the symptoms. Are, are you, are you, um, are you, do, do you know that paper? Like talk around yeah. that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So that's the religious order study. That was the first time that was shown really well. Yeah. And what they have found and what others have found since is that about a third of people who live into their 80s or 90s will have these pathologies in their brain. And certainly not a third of people will have dementia. So it's it was part of driving this concept of resilience or um, vulnerability to degeneration. So these people who have a bunch of pathology, the particular thing about the religious order studies and the nuns is that they will have had very habitual lifestyles, right? Right. So you know, it's a um, part of it maybe that the ritual was was able to to cover up some of the symptoms they might have otherwise had if they were you know having to do things that were a little bit outside of a a very strict routine uh, and people who live with dementia might you know live with people with dementia might be able to tell you that the people in their routines do a bit better but there is more to it than that we think that some people can just their brains can put up with a ton of pathology like full blown alzheimer's disease pathology and not have any symptoms whatsoever and we call that brain resilience 
And part of it is this idea that it's not really the lesions themselves, the plaques and the tangles, but part of it is also we think that the networks of people who, the brain networks of people who can have a lot of pathology are very, very strong and robust. So one way of thinking about this is if you look at population level, if people have more years of formal education, they are much less likely to develop dementia. Part of that will be confounded by socioeconomic status and diet and everything. But part of it, we think, even if you if you control it really well, part of it we do think is due to brain resilience. So you, when you do things like formal education, you're building more synaptic connections and stronger networks. And that means when you have damage to parts of the brain because of this pathology, the rest of the brain can make up for it. And you can see this in people who have a stroke, for example. If someone has a stroke and they have brain damage and they have problems moving, most people with a stroke who survive it can improve. And that's because their brain is actually rewiring. And so in, in, in the face of dementia pathology, your brain can sort of rewire if it's strong enough and make up for sort of just get around that damage. So yeah, the, the, these kind of studies are fascinating. But most people who have a huge amount of pathology will have symptoms at some point. I wanted to touch on brain resilience quite a lot. Um, do we know what are the major contributing factors to brain resilience? You know, this has got to be one of the most important things for people listening. You know, what can they do today, no matter what age they are, to make their brain more resilient as they age? Yeah, it's a great question. And brain health has become a hot topic. So we're trying to, as a field, not only understand the disease, but figure out ways to promote brain health and resilience. So the best evidence so far is keeping your brain and body active is going to protect your brain as you age. So exercise is good. Um, anything that's good for your heart and cardiovascular system is good for your brain because your brain needs quite a lot of oxygen. It needs good, strong blood vessels to get to get the blood up there to give you all the oxygen and glucose you need in your brain. So exercising is good for you. Um, not being sedentary, not being overweight, not having things like type 2 diabetes, all these things that are vascular risk factors tend to increase your risk for dementia. Smoking increases your risk, for example. Uh, Beyond vascular stuff, keeping socially stimulated and, and cognitively stimulated are associated with protection. I want to be really careful to, to with a couple of points here. One is we don't want to blame anyone who develops dementia because it's estimated that maybe 40 or 45 percent of dementias could have been prevented with modifiable risk factors, but that leaves more than half that couldn't, right? So we don't want to yeah. make anyone feel like they didn't do enough. And the second thing I want to make clear is that these risk factors are associations and scientifically you can't prove causation with these kind of things. So like right. I say, you can you can see a very strong association with the longer you stay in school, the less likely you are to develop dementia. But there could be a lot of other things involved in that process, right? There could be your diet and your socioeconomic status and your air quality, et cetera, et cetera. But the evidence from these big studies is is still showing strong associations with staying in education, keeping cognitively stimulated, keeping socially stimulated. And that includes getting hearing aids if you have hearing loss and getting your vision, like me, getting your vision correct if you have vision loss, because that all contributes to being able to keep your brain socially and cognitively stimulated. Um, avoiding head injury is always good. So trying not to play sports that are, uh, give you a risk of, of head injury. I'm trying to think of all the others. There's, there are 14 very strongly supported modifiable risk factors. And if people are interested, there was just an update to these by Gil Livingston and colleagues um, in the Lancet Commission. So they, they're they the ones who look at all the data from around the world and put it all together and find the strongest, most well-supported associations in the literature. The only new ones were uh, vision, correcting your vision, I believe, oh, cholesterol. But again, that's a vascular risk factor. So keeping right. your cardiovascular system healthy and keeping your brain and body active are really the key take-homes from, from that kind of study. Yeah, the hearing and the listening one were, were interesting. They're not on the vision, correcting those senses. That, that's not really an intuitive one of why that would impact, you know, neurodegeneration. Um, you know, you might even be able to think or incorrectly, as you say, but like trying to fight against having that corrective and trying to strain your eyes and working, that might even stimulate the neurons more and prevent it. But that's an interesting one that I haven't haven't heard of. Yeah, and it's those are relatively new. It's only been the past few years that the hearing loss and vision loss have been associated with increased dementia risk. And I would say the scientific evidence base from the fundamental neuroscience side is not there yet. So some people are arguing that it is actually something to do with the hearing loss that might be driving dementia. But I am more on the side of thinking it's probably more to do with your brain's resilience and your networks and keeping your brain engaged and active. But that's not really well established yet. Yeah, really interesting. I have a list of lifestyle factors here that I've heard in ah. newspaper articles, books, you know, BuzzFeed, everywhere about how these things either contribute to Alzheimer's, prevent it, or anything else. I want you to 
respond, shred them, destroy them, bring up interesting <laughs> studies. I'm genuinely curious on what the research says about these different things. So the first one is coffee. Yep. How does coffee impact neuro neurodegeneration? Uh, so it's not one of the well-established risk or protective factors for Alzheimer's disease or dementias. Um, there are some data to suggest suggest that caffeine boosts cognition, like I'm drinking coffee as we speak, and I'm, a, so I'm a, definitely a caffeine addict, so I want all of these to be true. Me too, um, me too. But the, uh, the actual evidence is, is good that in the short term, caffeine can boost your cognition, but of course, you got to think about your, and keeping in mind, caveat all of this with, I'm not that kind of doctor, I study the brain, so no, don't take my advice as medical, but on the evidence side, you want to balance keeping your cardiovascular system healthy and your heart healthy with, with things that boost your cognition, and all I can really say about caffeine is there's not conclusive evidence to suggest it is protective or otherwise in the dementia space. Perfect. What about learning a language, a secondary language, of course, in this yeah. case? Yeah. So again, it's not one of those top 14 that make the, the top of the list when you do these massive meta-analyses, but I have seen colleagues here in Edinburgh and worldwide providing really solid evidence that multiple languages are associated with reduced risk of dementia. And again, you got to be careful that it's an association, you can't prove causation. My best guess on this would be that it's again, boosting your brain. It's like staying in school or, you know, listening to neuroscience podcasts, you're engaging your brain. And that is generally good for protecting you from dementia. So it doesn't make your top 14, but there is some really solid evidence, associative evidence out there. Yeah. What about diet? And let's get specific here if we can about like, is there very specific diets that are generally very good for the brain? Because you hear a lot about Mediterranean diets, fish oils, kind of talk about a few of those talking points that you hear a lot in relation to diet, brain resilience and neurodegeneration. Yeah, so diet is not my area of expertise. I would say that in general, it's it's like everything in life. It's just about hard work and, and living a healthy lifestyle. So there is some evidence that specific diets like Mediterranean diets have been associated in some studies with lower risk, et cetera. But the evidence on balance, if you look all over the world, is really that just you've got to eat well, not be overweight, look after your, your vascular risk factors. So I wouldn't I wouldn't myself, it's not my area of expertise in particular, but I wouldn't stand behind any particular version of any diet or food additive or supplement that you see about in the news. Those are the kind of thing that I end up speaking to the Science Media Center about saying, well, this is, uh, you know, blueberries aren't going to cure your Alzheimer's disease or whatever it is. You know what I mean? It's the evidence just isn't there for anything in particular to be overwhelmingly behind any of them, in my view. You nailed that. Literally, blueberries is next on my mm. list. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah. I hear about blueberries all the time and dark skin fruits that contain anthocyanins that have antioxidants in them is there any really good evidence here well again there is evidence that a healthy diet and looking after your cardiovascular system is very good there's evidence that there are there is oxidative stress in the brain of people with neurodegenerative diseases and so it theoretically antioxidants are, are a good idea but the evidence base for any of these actually being an intervention or a prevention is just not really there it's more yeah. the evidence base is strongest for just really doing a good job with your diet and looking after yourself and exercising yeah is there any way we can parse apart exercising in terms of has there been good data on you know cardio versus weightlifting versus you know extreme endurance you know i i, I train for triathlon so i do a lot of cardio every week and i, I do a lot less you know, weightlifting than I used to. So I'm curious, like, has there been really good data parsing apart exercise in relation to neurodegeneration? Not that I have read. There have been um, some intervention trials called the FINGER trials. And I'm sorry, I can't remember what FINGER stands for, but Mia Capovelto runs these around the world. And they're sort of looking at people who are elderly and putting them into actual trials where they're either given exercises to do or not, just given sort of general healthy lifestyle advice. And the data so far on those hasn't been fantastic in terms of like it, it's not been massively successful as a clinical trial, but what, what what has been associated with much reduced risk is just exercise and, and good cardiovascular health. There's yeah, I can't think of anything in particular that is strong enough to reach it certainly hasn't reached the top 14 exercise is good yeah. <laughs> but nothing in particular has come out of this there are lots of studies and there's some good work going on but i don't i don't know enough about it to, to stand behind any particular kind of exercise right and is there any markers of exercise that you think are most relevant you know like mm -hmm. things like vo2 max or resting heart rate heart rate variability these are different sort of metrics that all watches kind of give you nowadays are any of those do you think particularly good at monitoring you know the the brain benefits or just 
general? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, just that the sedentary lifestyle is a big risk factor. So I think if you're keeping any of these things that you can track, like I have a, I have a, a watch as well, and I try and keep my activity rings closed and just keep my stand hours and things just to keep yourself generally active, I think is, is the take home from, from the biggest data sets, the most substantive data sets. Yeah. So what, I, what I'm hearing is balanced exercise, sleep, diet are, are just incredibly associative beneficial factors for your long-term brain resilience but there isn't any silver bullets any article newspaper or anything that says that there's a silver bullet you need to be doing this not that is there's probably not great evidence for it. probably not i mean i could you could, i could read the papers behind each one but i haven't seen anything that's, that says there's one single silver bullet no right let's talk about the genetics of alzheimer's disease sure oh sorry can i do one last thing on please. lifestyle so the, please, the thing that, um Oh, sorry. I was just about to have lost it again. Um, oh, yeah. So the last thing I wanted to say about lifestyle factors and the sort of associations is some of them might be reversed, right? So one of the things that's a risk factor associated with dementia is, is um, depression. And so you might think you want to go and get antidepressants, and that might be the case. But the other, the flip side is you could have depression because there are brain changes early on in the disease, right? So I just wanted to nail the point that even though there are strong associations, sometimes they're not causative. Sometimes they might right. even be effects of the early disease. So it's important not to blame yourself if you can't do these things or if you do end up with dementia despite your best efforts, of course. You just want to think about it. sometimes we don't really understand what these associations mean. We're trying as right. scientists, and that's where our group comes in. We come in on the fundamental side. We try to understand what the brain changes are associated with each of these things. Yeah, right. I love the balanced opinion that I get while speaking to neuroscientists. It's, it's my favorite part of doing this podcast is that the answer is always, we don't really know. There's some evidence here. There's some evidence there. But you listen to just so many podcasts these days. And they're like, yes, these are three things you need to do. I have the intervention protocols perfectly down. It's for this amount of time in this dosage. Here's the link so you can buy it. Use my discount code. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it's so prescriptive. And it's so exact. And it's so precise when really the reality of the whole thing is quite ambiguous. Yeah, and one of the beautiful things about neuroscience is that we don't have all of the answers, which is wonderful if you're a scientist, but very frustrating if you're someone who is living with dementia, because there's so much we don't know about the brain. Right. So let's dive into the genetics, and I'd love to hear about the genetics of Alzheimer's disease. Sure. So I told you earlier about there are really rare forms of familial Alzheimer's disease. That means you inherit it from one of your parents. It's autosomal dominant. It's because there is a gene variant or mutation and you get it but those are very very rare probably less than one percent of people with alzheimer's will have it because of a direct causative mutation and those all like i say converge on amyloid plaque accumulation to that amyloid pathway but there are a lot of genes that influence your risk and so it's a little bit like the lifestyle stuff we're talking about they're not causative so if you inherit one you're not guaranteed to get dementia but they're associated with a massive change in your risk profile. The biggest one of these is called apolipoprotein E epsilon 4 or ApoE4. Uh, we all have ApoE. We all have either two, three, or four variants. And the four variant increases your risk for Alzheimer's disease and the two variant de decreases your risk quite substantially. Uh, there's That was discovered in 1993 and there's still not a 100% clear cut answer as to why ApoE4 has this massive influence on your disease risk, but there's a huge amount of evidence to support that ApoE4 is involved in the deposition of amyloid in the brain and the clearance of amyloid from the brain, which is also important. ApoE4, we've shown, brings toxic amyloid directly to synapses, which is what, one of the things we think it's doing to, to cause damage to the brain. Uh, but the interesting thing about the risk genes is they're not directly involved in amyloid or tau. And in fact, most of the risk genes, I've told you about one, ApoE, most of the risk genes aren't even expressed in the neurons, the brain cells that are in the network, but they're highly expressed in the glia, so astrocytes and microglia. And these are support cells in the brain. Astrocytes are important for uh, metabolism of the neurons. They help clean up the synaptic cleft. They, they have metabolic support. They form part of your blood-brain barrier. And microglia are the immune cells of the brain. So if you get a virus in your brain, the microglia are supposed to eat it. But they're also important for maintaining brain surveillance and brain health. And for years, we'd, we'd only thought about these cells as a part of the reaction to the disease. So when you have pathology like plaques and tangles, you get what we call inflammation or gliosis, and you get these cells go crazy and they come around the plaques and they eat dying neurons if they had tangles in them, for example. 
but it was only in the sort of early 2000s when we were able to do genome-wide association studies that we found a whole bunch of risk genes that weren't in the neurons. So APOE is one that was discovered in the early 90s, but later on than that, in sort of 2010s, 2020s, there were a whole host of GWASs, so genome-wide association studies, that threw up a whole bunch of genes associated with risk, and a lot of those are expressed in microglia, and some also in the astrocytes. So that's sort of shifted the field again. We talked about a couple of shifts in the field. There was this massive shift in the field towards understanding what microglia are doing to increase your brain's vulnerability to disease. And that's been a fascinating part of the field to watch over the past couple of decades. Right. Would you mind giving a quick overview on what genome-wide association studies are and what the, what the aim of someone conducting one might be in relation to Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, sure. So I'm not a geneticist. We'll preface it with that. But <laughs> genome-wide association studies, you take thousands of people who donate a bit of blood generally, and you look at differences in the genes in people who would, who would have developed Alzheimer's disease versus those who didn't. So things there's, there's some studies right now in the UK, like UK Biobank, which is massive, and people have donated blood and have brain scans, and there's data about their medical history and their sort of diagnoses. And you're able to look at lots of different people when you need that kind of power because these genes like i say they don't cause the disease so you have to see if you have that gene are you more or less likely to develop dementias so you end up looking at uh, all across the genomes and all across all of your chromosomes looking at variants in genes because we all have variations right you know that because we all look a little bit different so that's caused by variations in our genes and some of these variants in our genes have, turn out to be either protective or harmful in terms of your risk profile for neurodegenerative diseases so that's been a very powerful technology and there's a, a scientist down at ucl professor sir john hardy who was one of the real driving forces in this and won the brain prize for his genetics they he helped discover the causative mutations and also all of these uh, more risk associated mutations so another recommendation for your podcast if you want a real expert on genetics and dementias right i'll definitely reach out i am um, to contextualize everything you're saying i actually did 23 and me about three years ago now and i do have one copy of the apoe4 alzheimer mutation genes and what they say i'm curious if this is correct i presume it is they say that I have a 5% greater chance of developing late stage Alzheimer's, so not early stage. Maybe we can also go into how those are different. Yeah. Um, and a 20 to 25% greater chance by age 85. Is that in yeah. line with, with, your, with your research and sort of the known, the known of the genetics? Yeah, so the, the, the statistic I always think about and quote is if you have one copy of E4, you're about three times more likely to develop dementia, as, as you say, later than 65 so as you're as you're much older uh, and if you get two copies if you're really unlucky you have two copies you're more than 12 times more likely to develop dementia than if you had the e3 which we think of as the neutral uh, gene but it's not a guarantee so that's the good news from your 23 me result is that there are a whole bunch of us who have one copy of e4 that don't end up to, de to go on to develop alzheimer's disease or dementia even as we age yeah and is that those population statistics do we know what sample that's taken from like 23 and me i don't know if that is that an american company is that taking like a hundred thousand people in america or maybe maybe a couple of million of people in america and that's how they're developing that that distribution that pop that population statistic yeah it's a really good question because historically we've had mostly uh northern european and north american white people participating in our studies genetics and otherwise but there's a real effort now to actually get a more diverse population. And there are differences, known differences, and I'm sorry, I don't know them off the top of my head, but there are known differences in the effects of an APOE gene in people from a white ancestry versus people from a Latino or a black ancestry. I don't really, I don't remember the exact numbers on this, but there are differences in how these risk genes affect your risk depending on your background and sort of your genes that are not just that one gene, right. they all sort of work together. So it's a really good question. And the field is moving actively to try and recruit more diverse participants because we want to know not only about the risks for people from all different backgrounds, but that things that we're developing in terms of therapeutics and treatments, we want to be sure that they're going to work for everybody or know if that we need to have different approaches for everybody. Exactly. Like I would love to be a part of any, I don't know if you know, any research group that is currently running the trial of like a 60 year longevity study on someone who's training for triathlon, right? Because I just would <laughs> love to know what like what, what extreme amounts of cardio actually do to impact this. You know, like yeah. if that, that would be so fascinating to me. You know, I'd love, I'd love any data related to that. Well, I could tell you and all of your listeners to check out joindementiaresearch.org because that is how you can get into lots of different studies regarding dementia. And we need not just people living with dementia, but people who aren't, right, controls. Um, I'm not aware of, off the top of my head of any studies particularly looking at extreme exercise and dementia. There, 
probably are some going on in the ALS world. So you've probably heard of ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or motor neuron disease is also called because there are associations. And again, we don't know if they're causative between extreme exercise and increased risk for ALS or MND. Uh, don't know why, but people who are in active military service and do sort of extreme exercise have a slightly increased chance of developing that disease, but you would have a decreased chance of developing dementia because of the exercise. Yeah, that's why that's what I'm curious, because when I read a population statistic like that, you know, one of the things my scientific degree taught me to do is to speculate on what sample group that's from, you know, because if you're taking a particularly possibly unhealthy group of, you know, I know they'll try to get a widespread, but it's kind of known that, you know, a lot of the, the health in, in America is quite different to the health in Europe and the diets are completely different. So I'd argue if there's much correlation you can draw at all between a person in an American diet versus a European diet with these sort of statistics, exercise plans, you know, so many lifestyle variables as we've talked about. I am, I'd love to just know if there was any greater data sets on those different populations to see if there was any difference between them. Yeah, there's certainly growing data sets from lots of different populations around the world. So there are growing data sets from different countries, from different demographics, and okay. with active inclusion to get people from diverse ethnic backgrounds and to, to not just have white upper middle class people who tend to be the people who volunteer <laughs> for studies because they have the time, I guess, or you know, yeah. the, uh, the sort of background and, and sort of socioeconomic background to find that of, of interest. So there is active recruitment going on, but I don't know the data well enough yet to know the right. details of the different populations. And um, it's so far, especially related to exercise. I don't know at all what, how that's going. Yeah, gotcha. Um, is there any difference in the disease pathology of early and late stage Alzheimer's? Is it just simply that one has shifted forward about 20 or 10 years or so is seems to be about the right number, but is there any difference in the actual pathology itself? Yes. So if you're talking about anyone with Alzheimer's disease, their pathology starts off in a uh, in a pretty stereotypical pattern. Most people's pathology starts in the similar parts of the brain. Amyloid starts to deposit out in what we call the default mode network, which is the parts of your brain that are active when you're just doing nothing, when you're watching TV or lying in a scanner <laughs> or daydreaming. Whereas tau starts in the medial temporal lobe, right in a part of the brain called the entorhinal cortex, kind of under behind your ear, in a very small part of the brain. And then it spreads through the brain. Both amyloid and tau spread through the brain. And that's what's happening over that decade. So it's really fascinating. That's one of the things we work on in the lab is how, especially tau, is getting through the brain. Because wherever tau pathology goes in the brain, neurons die. And in mice, at least, when we stop that propagation, you stop the symptoms completely, and the mice can even get a little bit better because of their brain plasticity. So we're, we and many others in the field are really working on how is tau getting out of this tiny part of the medial temporal lobe and spreading all over the brain? Because if we can stop that, we think we'll be able to stop disease progression. Interesting. I mean, let's dive into some of your research. My understanding is that it is focused on tau pathologies, but let, let's let's dive into some of your research and what kind of what big questions have you been really interested in solving in the last couple of decades in relation to Alzheimer's disease and tau pathologies? Yeah, thanks. So we we don't don't work just on tau. I'll come to that one. I started off actually working on both amyloid and tau, um, and we still continued that to this day, although the focus has changed. So we've always been interested in how synapses are lost. Why are they dying? And how is the pathology affecting the synapses? And we started that off in amyloid, and we found that amyloid beta, uh, the sticky peptide that makes up the plaques, but the oligomers, not the big fibrils, actually can stick to individual synapses, both in mouse and in human brain. We developed the techniques to be able to see inside synapses in postmortem human tissue. And for the first time, we saw sticky amyloid oligomers inside the synapses. And we also saw in that type of study that ApoE4, one of the things ApoE4 is doing is bringing that toxic amyloid to the synapses where it's doing the damage. More recently, we've started looking at this idea of how are glia involved in this process? So how do microglia and astrocytes uh, work together with synapses and how are they involved in synapse loss? There's been some amazing evidence from mice that microglia in particular eat synapses. They're, that, that's normal during development. They help prune or, or sculpt your circuit, but this seems to go wrong in dementias and around plaques and mice. There had been this data showing microglia eating synapses. We were able to show that happens in human brain, but what we saw that was surprising is that actually the astrocytes, the other kind of glial cell that we look at, eat more synapses in human brain than microglia. And one of the key things that we're trying to figure out now is 
is is this glia eating synapses is this really part of driving the disease process is this killing synapses and driving your cognitive decline or is this just cleaning up dead synapses because that's what these cells are supposed to do are they just being good trash compactors and going through and cleaning up the rubbish right or or pruning sick synapses so we're trying to understand those synapse glia interactions and that happens a lot around plaques but it also happens with tau containing synapses so now i'll jump to the tau side of things in our work we were from one of the first groups when i was still in boston to show that it's not the big tangles themselves but the soluble forms of tau that seems to be killing cells We've shown soluble forms of tau clumping up inside synapses in human brain. And recently we showed that oligomers, those just a few copies of tau stuck together, not only do they accumulate in synapses, but they seem to be spreading through the brain by jumping out of one neuron into the next neuron by going from the presynapse to the postsynapse. So usually we started the conversation with what's a synapse and you get this release of a, a signal that's picked up by the other cell. Well, we've shown that tau is one of the things that can be released from presynaptic terminals and can get into the postsynaptic side and then start the pathological changes, the oligomerization and the accumulation of tau in the downstream neuron. And your neurons have really long processes. You know, you can go from your motor cortex down to the bottom of your uh, spinal cord with one single axon, right? Because that's how your motor cortex tells your legs to move. So in the brain, you have similar things from that part of the brain where tau pathology starts, the entorhinal cortex, neurons send axons to the next part of the brain that gets tau pathology and the next and the next. And so the, the propagation of tau pathology through the brain follows neural circuits. And we've been able to show that tau can jump from one cell to another, oligomers of tau. And we're trying to understand now, how is it jumping? What's, what's letting it out? What's letting it in the other side? Because we really want to stop that process to try and stop the disease progression. Right. I never knew that it always started in the same place in the brain. That's quite an interesting one. Is there anything specific about the organization of the entorhinal cortex or something there? And why is that always the origin? Because I didn't know that that was the case. It's such a good question. So we call that selective vulnerability. We don't know why some parts of the brain are vulnerable to pathology in any of these diseases. And it is a great question. And it's not every single person. There are a few people who have atypical forms of Alzheimer's disease that might start out in the visual cortex. But for the vast majority, that progression of tau is so stereotypical that we use it to stage the disease. It's called Brock staging. A, a, a couple of neuropathologists define the disease progression by where the tangles are. And it's, it is very predictable and stereotypical. Um, right. So we've just gotten a little bit of a handle on how tau is moving, but why it starts in the first place in those cells is still up in the air. There's some really good work going on in that area, but we don't know for sure. Interesting. And how long might this pathology be building before any behavioral phenotypes start being observed? Yeah, we think amyloid builds up in the brain for about a decade before there's any effect. About a decade, um, wow. And ta tau, in some ways, is even earlier, but it stays restricted to tiny, tiny parts, the, the, the entorhinal cortex, but also even before that in the brainstem, there's a little bit of tau pathology in most people as we age. But what I think, and what a lot of us are starting to think, is that that tiny restricted amount of tau pathology doesn't do you any damage, and almost all of us as we age will have that with never a symptom. But very interestingly, when the amyloid gets from that default mode network down into the medial temporal lobe where tau accumulation starts, that seems to open the gate, and that's when tau gets out. We don't really understand how amyloid and tau are related directly, but that's one of the things I'm kind of most excited about and think is one of the strongest uh, sort of theories is that amyloid pathology getting to the parts of the brain where tau is lets it then accelerates its movement out of that part of the brain. So in terms of pathology, you have a little bit of tau and you have a lot of amyloid if you're on the path to Alzheimer's for at least a decade before wow. you have full-blown dementia. Um, many years, yeah, it's, it's a very slow process. So they're evil partners in crime that are plotting, <laughs> plotting together for many, many decades, well, decade long periods of time before anything is really observed. Exactly. I, I, know, I know you're not a clinician, but it kind of it kind of shouts out to me that we are waiting way too long to deal with this problem. You know, like yeah. if, if it's building for a decade and then somebody starts to have some learning and memory difficulties, I think one of the first symptoms is also like locational problems, getting lost in places and things mm -hmm. like but that. It seems to me that that's way too late to actually deal with the core problem. Absolutely. So once your brain is already once you've lost. OK, I'll start that sentence again. <laughs> so by the time you have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, most people have lost half of the neurons in their entorhinal cortex. Half. Wow. Right? So that part of your brain is already That's well on its way to statistic. dying. Yeah. Ah, so by the time any symptom is observed. By the time that. you have a diagnosis. Yeah. So wow. you would have. Crazy. Uh, yeah, exactly. So one of the things in the field that we've learned is that a whole bunch of the clinical trials directed at removing amyloid failed in the early stages. And a lot of people now think that's because it was too late, right? It's, it's clear now that removing amyloid 
uh, when you already have symptoms is not going to stop the disease. It's slowing it down, which is great, but it's not going to stop the disease. And I think that's probably because it's too late and the tau pathology is already running wild. But the good news is we've gotten a lot better at identifying who is in those early phases. And again, I don't see people until I have their brains after they agree to donate. So uh, this is not my personal experience, but right. as a field, it's been amazing. So uh, it used to be that you couldn't get a, a firm uh, diagnosis of Alzheimer's until you died and somebody took a bit of your brain and looked at it. But the, the, the tests for cognitive change have gotten better over time. They're not quite so crude. The, the ability to detect the changes in the brain by looking in cerebrospinal fluid is amazing. So if people are willing to donate a bit of, have a lumbar puncture, which is not you know, a popular technique, but lumbar puncture can detect changes in amyloid and tau that reflect changes in the brain in that very, very early phase. And now, right at, just at this meeting, I was at a couple of weeks ago in Philadelphia at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference. Over the past year or two, the evidence that you can detect changes in the blood is phenomenal. So now you can take blood from someone and you can see forms of phosphorylated tau. And the one that's the best right now is called P tau 217. So it's tau that's got a phosphate group added at position 217. You can detect that in the blood. And it's fascinating because that's really sensitive at showing who has not tau pathology, but who has amyloid pathology in the brain. Uh, right. And that we think is because right around plaques, you get these, uh, these what we call dystrophic neurites. You get swellings of neurons that accumulate this kind of pathological tau. And we think that's how it's leaking out. But it's gotten so sensitive that it's on the path to be approved not in the too distant future, at least in the United States, as a biomarker, which means you can take a blood and tell that people are in the early stages. It's not, you know, it's not perfect. There's a lot of variability in the amount of P-town people's blood, but we're getting closer and closer to a blood test that can tell if you're likely to be in the early stages of dementia. And that's going to, that's really transformative for all of these yeah. forthcoming treatments. Like if our lab, you know, we don't do the, we, we're not actually giving drugs to people, but if our lab does find something that could slow the progression of tau, we need to know who's in that very early stage to be able to give them that treatment to stop that progression. Otherwise it's too late. You've already lost half your neurons and you're not going to get those back. Right. So if we do develop these blood tests that are very predictive of how the pathology might progress, does that mean that since they, since those these biomarkers will precede any behavioral phenotypes, we still need to basically just test everyone at a particular age or something like that, right? Because people can't voluntarily come forward and sort of say, come to a doctor's office and say, right, I'm worried in a decade I might have Alzheimer's. It's just not really how people work. It will have to almost be that if we have a test that can predict it 10 years ahead of time, there's a certain age that everyone goes in for this test. Would that be sort of correct? Do you think that that might be how it would play out? In the future, but I think we're a little pretty good distance from that because okay. at the minute even if we could detect who is in the early stages there's not a lot we could do for you right so these two new treatments that are approved in the united states wouldn't be safe enough to roll out at population level right so some people who get these treatments they're actually antibodies that you are injected into your bloodstream and they suck the amyloid out of your brain but they're quite dangerous uh, in some people they cause brain swelling they can they cause death in a few of the people in the trial so it's not safe enough to say oh you might have early alzheimer's we're going to give you this treatment but in the future when we have safer uh, interventions that could slow things that aren't quite so risky and and so expensive and, and difficult you have to have brain scans uh, to monitor for these symptoms you have to have the infusions every few weeks. Um, so once we have treatments that are safer downstream in the future, yes, it would be great to do sort of, you know, like these days, I don't think too much about the neck down, but I'm sure you get sent a kit in the mail in your late 50s or something to send a poo sample, right, to screen for colon cancer or something like that. Right. In the right. future, you know, decades down the line, I would love for you to be able to take a blood test say you might be in the early stages of dementia and for us to have something safe enough that we could prevent that from progressing into ever having symptoms that would be the ideal and i think we'll get there right that made that made that's the intuitive approach right that makes sense if we did have the technology to diagnose it now what would what would the treatment be i know you say we don't really have anything that's great but like what would the best science give to that person today would it be anti-inflammatories cholinergic agents a combination of both kind of what what do you think would be the best treatment that we currently have available for Alzheimer's? Yes, so it depends on where you are in the world. Um, but even if you're in the United States where we do have the disease modifying treatments approved, I, like I say, I don't treat patients. I'm not even that kind of doctor, but talking to my colleagues who do, they have a discussion with their with the people who come to them and say, look, there is now a drug that could slow disease progression, but only by a few months at best estimate. And you're going to spend an awful lot of those months in the hospital getting lots of tests. And so wow. at the minute, at the minute, I, I, you know, I, from what I know, some people are prescribing these, these disease modifying treatments, but not everyone is, is taking them up and they're still so risky. So at the minute, there's still the standard of care 
would be talking to their, their GP about these symptomatic treatments, which are things like the cholinergic cholinesterase inhibitors that will boost your symptoms and keep going. And um, even at the stage of diagnosis, keeping active and engaged can be helpful to some people anecdotally, you know, I don't know the data aren't amazing for intervention trials with exercise, but anecdotally with the people we work with in Alzheimer's Scotland and people who come and visit us in the lab um, and people who just have the more, more meaningful engagement with their friends and family and keeping themselves active seems to be, you know, anecdotally at least useful. So there's not, unfortunately, there's not an awful lot science-based that is going to, to do anything to slow the disease progression at the minute that is, is widely available. Right. Which is kind of shocking, right? Or or is that shocking? Because we've, you know, we've been investigating Alzheimer's in some way or another for maybe five or six decades. I am, oh, yeah. And we've been able to observe something in the brain. It's something that I, I'm not sure what the exact prevalence is, but a large proportion of the population suffers from this. It affects basically everybody. Um, do you think that Alzheimer's research is underfunded? Uh, well, yes. I mean, of course, I have a bias because this is my field, but it's been more than five or six decades. These pathologies in the brain were described in 1906. So this has been 120 years <laughs> almost that we've been trying to figure this out. But there have been all sorts of reasons why we haven't made progress. One is that the brain is exceedingly complicated. We don't yeah. really understand how it works in the first place. And I'm sure you go over a, a lot of amazing, wonderful things about the brain in your podcast. So not being able to cure a, a very complex disease is not a shocker for, for not even understanding how memory and and thinking work in the first place. Secondly, uh, for many years, people thought that dementia, even though it had been discovered and described in 1906 by Alice Alzheimer, a lot of people just put it down to age and just said, you know, this is this is just age. And it's really taken some conversations uh, amongst all of the stakeholders, people living with dementias and scientists and doctors and politicians to understand that these are not just age. These are diseases. And as diseases, we should be able to treat them. And then the third thing, as you point out, is funding, right? So we have, like you mentioned, one in two of us are predicted to be affected by dementia in our lifetimes, either as someone who lives with it or someone who cares for someone with dementia. And in terms of research funding, things like cancer research receive about 10 times more funding than dementia research per wow. capita in the UK. And that's worked. The good news about that, I'm not saying we shouldn't fund cancer research because you yeah. think back to when we were kids or when I was a kid anyway, cancer was thought of as a death sentence. And now there are so many cancers that are treatable. And, and that really shows that research works. Right. We know that also from things like COVID. We threw all the money in the world at COVID and had a vaccine and you know, a, a not huge amount of time. And there was a huge amount of work behind that, obviously, but it just does help. Like the funding does help. So it's getting better over the years that I've been involved. The UK government and the charities have banded together and formed a UK Dementia Research Institute. There's been a big movement to support dementia research, but still compared to other biomedical fields, we are underfunded. So it, it that is difficult for recruiting the best minds. We need the smartest people. <laughs> we need to be able to recruit and test a lot of ideas. And so more funding would absolutely help. So I tell people, not only we've talked about lifestyle factors, take good care of yourself to reduce your own risk. Also vote well, try and, try and convince the people who you vote for in your elected representatives that this is important and they right. should they should fund us and and you know you can work with charities you can participate in research through joint dementia research and you can give money to charities like there's lots of alzheimer's research uk alzheimer's scotland alzheimer's society and they directly fund us to do research so right. absolutely that's one of our issues I'll leave a few donation links in the description for anyone that wants to. I would love to brainstorm ways that I could fundraise money for Alzheimer's research. I'll run across Ireland or do a lap across Ireland <laughs> or cycle. I don't know, something stupid. It's a, something that I would fundraise because um, I would love to I'd love to see more research conducted. Um, the work that you do is incredibly important and this has been so enjoyable. I want to leave with just one one final question. Um, where do you think Alzheimer's where do you think an Alzheimer's cure will come from? Where, where do you, if you, if in the next decade, project forward, mm -hmm. even invent some technologies if you want, like what would need to be invented? Where would money need to go for us to have a very good, what you would be satisfied calling a cure for Alzheimer's disease? That's a great question, Evan. Okay, so first I'll say I'm very optimistic that we will have something that's really meaningful for, for life changing in terms of treatments for dementias. Um, cure might be a tough one. <laughs> I, but I think we'll get there. I think maybe over the next decade or two, we'll get there. Where it's going to come from as a scientist is harder to predict. I could I could make some predictions and say what I think is most exciting. But one of the beautiful things about science is you don't know, right? Until you've tested it and you've done the work, you don't know what's going to work out. But I think the one I'm most excited about is this idea of stopping 
the tau moving through the brain. So we are actively looking, and there's lots of groups around the world looking for, let's understand how tau is jumping from one part of the brain to the other. We could stop that, and then we could stop the disease. So where does money need to go for that, or funding need to go? There's a whole ecosystem. There's the fundamental scientists like us who are looking inside individual tiny bits of brain, et cetera, or using IPSCs or model systems to, to try and manipulate this sort of thing. And that's a big piece for the early stage discovery. You also need to obviously work with industry to fund trials or clinical trials that go along with that because those cost billions. They are not something that I can get a grant for. Uh, so you need to work with industry because they're taking on a lot of the risk to develop these safe, effective treatments. And then you also need to invest in the infrastructure. So right now in the UK, we don't have I mean, you'll have heard about the NHS struggling. We don't have enough infrastructure. Even if we did have a treatment, we don't yeah. have the infrastructure to, to deliver it to people. So we need to have tool up our healthcare systems around the world to be able to deliver drugs that might have to be injected in IV or might have to be even injected into your spinal cord, into the um, intrathecal, we call it, like into the CSF, um, because some of the tau lowering agents are ASOs or antisense oligonucleotides, and those need to go straight into your your sort of nervous system. So we need to have the doctors and the nurses and the facilities, the scanners to watch progression, these blood tests. So there's a huge ecosystem that needs to tool up. And that is kind of the easy win because we know that something's going to come through and we know we're going to need some more capacity. <laughs> so in a way, even though we don't know exactly what it's going to be, it would be, in my opinion, even though I'm not that kind of doctor, it would be the time to start tooling up the ability to treat a lot of people because, as you say, this affects a lot of people. So it's a huge question. I'm most excited about stopping tau pathology. Also, there's a lot going on about how these glial cells are involved in this, how we can harness the power of your innate immune system in the brain to stop the disease progressions. So there's a lot going on in that space. So I think one of those is probably going to kind of come out and be the big through. My biggest prediction would be there'll be a combination. We could lower the amyloid, we could stop the tau progression, we could harness that inflammation or reduce that inflammation to, to protect the brain. And together, hopefully all of those could be a cure. Even better, I hope we get a prevention. That would be even better. <laughs> <laughs> incredible incredible dr tara spires jones this has been such such a pleasure so much fun such an important discussion i think as we've said alzheimer's impacts one and two people dementia impacts one of two people and i think in general the information behind it is really lacking so i hope that this discussion was able to was able to fill in some of the blanks for some people it's been an absolute pleasure i will link all of your research labs work anything else below because i think everyone should go follow the work that you're doing i am um, thank you so much it's been such a pleasure Thank you so much. Pleasure to talk to you.